We had several counties around us that had recycling programs, we're all small counties, and we were having difficulty moving our materials by ourselves because we just don't generate that much. So we decided that by coming together and combining the materials that all of our facilities collected, it would be so much easier for us to move materials because they would like truckload volumes of one particular item, you know, like all cardboard or all plastic. And so by combining our loads together, we were able to do that and, and move materials much easier. And I might point out that the counties were pretty successful in collecting, but we had no way of getting rid of it. And that's why we formed a cooperative. In the beginning, there was lots of education. You know, they had the Kansas Don't Spoil It program and several different offshoots of that. So there was a lot of support with the education and then the solid fee tipping fund has been tremendous for us out here because without that money, most of these facilities wouldn't even exist because that's what put these facilities in place and purchased most of our equipment. I think all of our counties combined that used to work together over a million dollars. My particular county, our landfill is basically on its last leg as far as capacity and so for a small county of 3,500 to be able to dig another cell. There's so many rules and regulations that it's easily over a million dollars to get a new cell. So the more that we keep out of the landfill, the longer life we have on our particular landfill. And the county commissioners in my county and, and in Rollins County especially have been very supportive because they know what it's doing. With our facility, all of our member counties then the recycling centers have the public come in and sort their materials for the workers there. And they come in and they sort it into separate bins and then the workers do quality control on it to make sure what they put in the box is what was supposed to be there. And then when it comes here, we do final quality control so that when we sell our bills and materials, we know that there is very little, if any, contamination at all so our buyers get 100% of what they're looking for. And single stream, Everything gets commingled together. And when it goes to a MRF, it's on the tipping floor and they have loaders that run over it and pick it up and put it in a machine. And so glass gets crushed and embedded in the plastics and paper makes it into plastics and aluminum cans makes it where it shouldn't go. And so those bells that come out of a MRF have quite a bit of contamination. I've, I've been told up to 30%. So when a buyer buys those bills, there's a, quite a bit of contamination in them that they're not going to be able to use, so they're going to have to buy more product in order to make whatever they're making, where with ours, they get what they pay for. And that's the deal, you know, in these small communities, people take it serious. And uh, for them to know that maybe their stuff is being co-mingled and sent off, and part of it's going to a landfill because it is contaminated, it's not, uh, not a good thing. Kansas was getting ready to issue the City of Hayes a new NPDES permit, which is National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. And they were going to include nitrogen and phosphorus removal limits that our previous permit didn't have and our current plant couldn't treat. So we had to have a new treatment plant to get those out. There's been a couple of safety improvements out here. As you can see behind me, these are UV modules, ultraviolet light modules. Before we disinfected with gas chlorine, it's probably the most common disinfection method in the world for water, but uh, it's inherently dangerous. It's dangerous for employees, staff out here, and it's dangerous for, for the community too as well if you would ever have a ruptured tank. So we got rid of that and went to ultraviolet, so increased safety and, uh, you know, reliability too. You know, we, we were kind of on pins and needles at the, at the beginning of this project, the end of the old plant. So having some increased reliability, increased redundancy has uh, changed the game for us. There's naturally occurring microbes in your body that we facilitate and treat and it does the work for us. You know, they're just like us. They want air, they want water, and they want something to eat and they want a comfortable place to be. So we provide them with all that. It's something that we keep a close eye on every day. We look at the microscope and, and ensure that we've got a good stable sludge to treat. At the influent pump station, that's where there's 120 or so miles of sanitary sewer and haze. It all converges right there to that influent pump station. The first step of treatment is the headworks facility. Really, with that headworks facility, what we're trying to do is get out the stuff that doesn't belong in the water. Stuff like rags, grease, 
kids' toys, silly stuff that gets flushed down the toilet. After that water is screened and degridded, it goes to the magic step, which is the aeration basin. The aeration basin is where we cycle air on and off to provide the oxic and anoxic cycles for you're removing that BOD and ammonia during your oxic cycle, you shut the air off and those anoxic bugs come to life and deal with your nitrogen and phosphorus. Once it's done in that basin, that hits two final clarifiers, and those final clarifiers are really just like kind of a quiet zone to allow the clear water on the top and the sludge on the bottom to separate. We take some of that sludge and what's called return activated sludge and we pump that back to the basin. So after it sits in that final for a little bit, those bugs in the bottom of there are oxygen starved and hungry. So they're ready to do a lot of work for us. So we return about a third of those back to the process and the other two thirds we waste away. So after that clear water comes off of those finals, it comes through a disc filter system, which is a 40 micron system that'll take out any other things that may be in there and then it comes through UV. So everything gets a small dose of UV, but anything that gets reused either on site here or at the golf course gets a super dose of UV, which is pretty much like hitting the water with a lightning bullet. Now back to the waste, so that stuff that we can't use, we further break down with air and time, and we end up spinning that through a centrifuge and land applying that on the farm fields, uh, local farm fields, um, as, a, as a soil conditioner and a uh, small amount of fertilizer, but it, it's a great soil conditioner and, and really helps retain moisture and good stuff for our area for sure. This plant, like most plants in the state, is designed to treat BOD, biochemical oxygen demand, and ammonia. This one is also a BNR facility, biological nutrient removal. We're able to treat phosphorus, also get out nitrates and nitrites from the water. You now our old plant was putting out about 300 pounds of nitrogen per day, and again, I mentioned earlier, we're putting out 18 now, so it's, that's a 94% reduction or something in, in total nitrogen release. So this thing, like I say, uh, does what exactly as we're designed to do and better. We reuse about 25% of our water for irrigation purposes at the golf course, and we have a sports complex as well that traveling teams can come to. So we expanded irrigation capacity out there by 750,000 gallons. So we have about 4 million gallons in reserve out there all the time that is just sitting there ready for a dry, hot day. And if we didn't have the ability to reuse that water, we couldn't have a great sports complex or golf course without being able to reuse water.